formal hearing. Um, Commissioner Costin is not here. Ms. Hipton is now back. And um, before we get started, I'd ask Commissioner Bowler to say the prayer, by the pledge of allegiance by Mr. Parker. Stand up, please. We look to the heavens and give thanks. At this season of Thanksgiving, we thank you for the Atlantic Ocean that sends waves to our beaches and reminds us of the power of nature. We thank you for the opportunity to self-govern from these local commissions and hearings all the way to Washington and the peaceful trans transition of political power. We thank you for the diversity of opinions and concerns that gives us insight to make good decisions today. Please guide us in our effort to be good stewards to the city of Virginia Beach. Amen. Thank you. If we could please take some time. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to start with the staff and also the commissioners to introduce themselves. If I can start with our legal over here on our far, my far right. Tori Eisenberg, Deputy City Attorney. Michael Motch, I have the pleasure of serving the entire city as the at-large district representative. Good afternoon. Naomi Astar is representing District 1, Kempsville. Good afternoon, John Cromwell, District 2, Pungo and Blackwater. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mike Anderson, District 3. Hi, Catherine Byler, District 4, which is Town Center all the way up to Newtown Road where Norfolk begins. George Alcarez, District 5. Holly Cuellar, District 8. Brian Plumley representing beautiful District 6, which is from historic SeaTac community through the North End. Susan Hippen, District 7, Salem High School, Tallwood High School, College Park. William Parks, District 10. Caitlin Alcock, Planning Administrator. Clerking to my left, we have Kristen Bauer and Beth Mowry. In the audience, we have Planning Director Kathy Warren, Deputy Director Carrie Bookholt. With our Planning Administration team, we have Marcelle Coleman and Alexis Bailey. With our IT support, we have Faith Walowskis and Rachel Levere. And then with our Zoning Administration group, we have Zoning Administrator Kevin Kemp and Deputy Zoning Administrator Brandon Hackney. All right, great. Thank you, commissioners and staff. At this point, I'd ask uh, the clerk to describe the rules of order of business today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Virginia Beach Planning Commission takes pride in being fair and courteous to all parties in attendance. It is important that all involved understand how the commission normally conducts its meetings. It is equally important that everyone treat each other and the members of the commission with respect and civility. We request that cell phones be put on silent during this meeting. This is an abbreviated explanation of the rules. The complete set of rules is located in the front of the Planning Commission agenda. Following is the order of business for this public hearing. Withdrawals and deferrals. The chairman will ask if there are any requests to withdraw or defer an item on the agenda. Consideration of these requests will be made first. Consent agenda. The second order of business is the consideration of the consent agenda, which are those items that the Planning Commission believe are unopposed and which have favorable staff recommendation. Regular agenda. The Commission will then proceed with the remaining items on the agenda. When an agenda item has been called, we will recognize the applicant or their representative first. Following the applicant or their representative, in-person speakers will be called next, and then the speakers participating via WebEx. Speakers in support or opposition of an agenda item will have three minutes to speak, unless they are solely representing a large group, such as a Civic League or Homeowners Association, in which case they will have 10 minutes. If a speaker does not respond or if a technical issue occurs which renders the comments unintelligible, we will move on to the next speaker or the next order of business. Please note that the actions taken by the Commission today are in the form of a recommendation to the Virginia Beach City Council. The final decision to approve or disapprove an application will be made by the City Council. The Commission thanks you for your attendance and we hope that your experience here today leaves you feeling that you've been heard and treated fairly. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. The next order of business is that we um, vote on the minutes, planning commission minutes for October 9th. I have a motion. So moved. Mr. Motch has a motion. Any second? A second. A second with Ms. Quaylar. Give us one moment. We're having a technical difficulty. Apologies. <clears throat> The vote is now open. <laughs> by a vote of, uh, by a recorded vote of nine to one, the October 9th, 2024 formal minutes have been recommended for approval. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Our next order of business is for consideration of requests for withdrawal or deferrals. Are there any applicants here that would like to withdraw their application? The record state there are none. Are there any applicants that would like to defer their application? The record shows that there are none. All right, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to our vice chair so she can go over the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we have five items on the consent agenda. These are applications that are recommended for approval by staff on the planning and the planning commission has concurred. There are no speakers signed up in opposition. Our first agenda item is item number four, Lakewood Home Builders. Is there a representative here today to speak on this? <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission for the record, Billy Garrington, on behalf of the applicant, Lakewood Home Builders, 2000 Virginia Beach Boulevard. Our disclosure statement is current. All of our fees have been paid. Four conditions attached with us with a staff write up in total agreement with those four conditions. Thank you for considering this on consent agenda. And again, I'd like to thank Marshall Coleman for all of her fine work that she always does and wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. We all got a lot to be thankful for. Thank you so much. Is there any opposition to this item being placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, I have asked Commissioner Plumley to read this into the record. The applicant Lakewood Home Builders has requested a conditional use permit for an indoor recreational facility. This is at 2000 Virginia Beach Boulevard. It's a, uh, an application to convert 9,900 square feet of, East, uh, of uh, East Coast Appliance Retail Building into an indoor rec. It was determined by the planning staff that it was not in compliance with the comprehensive plan. However, our staff is recommending approval um, based on this being a, a vacant commercial space that will provide a needed um, opportunity for the community. And therefore, with the recommendation of our wonderful staff, um, there being no objection from the community, the Planning Commission has placed this on the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Our next item is item number six, Tidewater Structures, LLC. If I can have a representative come forward. Welcome. Welcome, good afternoon. Um, here we have a home addition and remodel for a disabled veteran to have better access for his home and have a, you know, a cooking and living space downstairs on the first story. Uh, we're not changing any type of use on the property, but it is zoned incorrectly. Thank you. And could you please state your name for the record? Yep. Name is Will Honeycutt. Um, Mr. Honeycutt, are the conditions acceptable to you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you. Is there any opposition to this item being placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, I've asked Commissioner Parks to read this into the record. <clears throat> Thank you. The applicant seeks a change in nonconformity to build an addition onto an existing legally nonconforming duplex in the Shadowlawn Heights neighborhood. The applicant seeks to enlarge the existing unit by adding a 352 square foot addition at the rear portion of the first floor and a 72 square foot addition on the second floor. These additions will provide increased ease of living and accessibility to the homeowner who is permanently disabled military veteran. The proposed additions will be keeping with the existing structure and include 30-year architectural asphalt shingles, exterior body and sidle, and corner trim. 
hearing no oppositions and a favorable staff recommendation, we felt it was appropriate for the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Our next item is agenda item number nine, Tiffany Corey Brown. Hello, welcome. Hello, my name is Tiffany Corey Brown and I'm here for 5701 Thurston Avenue is to open up a daycare center, it's all about new daycare center. And Ms. Corey Brown, are the conditions acceptable to you? Yes, ma'am. In our conversation, we um, want to ask you if, if we could amend this to include the vinyl, vinyl fencing. Thing. Yes, ma'am, and I did I let Madison know that I was okay with that. And so you do agree to that condition and yeah. when we vote, we'll vote with that amendment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any opposition to this item being placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, I've asked Commissioner Byler to read this into the record. The applicant requests a conditional use permit for a daycare center. The property falls within the Burton Station SGA. The area of the SGA calls for a light industrial, flexible office use space. The vision for the Burton Station SGA deems this area to be unsuitable for residential or neighborhood retail uses. While the project does not perfectly align with the overall goals of the SGA, it serves an important role for the community. A daycare center will provide a much needed resource for those working in the industrial park and surrounding areas. And the area consists mostly of light industrial office use. The daycare center will not be completely out of character with the area as there is an elementary school to the east of the property that serves the neighboring residential communities. Staff believes the proposed daycare center will not only provide educational opportunities for preschool and school age children, but will also provide child care opportunities for the workforce in the immediate area where this type of service is limited. Staff has further recommended some conditions and applicant has agreed to all of those. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Our next item is item number 10, Sintera Virginia Beach Hospital. Good afternoon, Planning Commission, and thank you for putting us on the consent agenda today. For the record, my name is Josh Seeger, Corporate Director of Construction for Sentara. Sentara is going through a system-wide branding update, and as a part of that, multiple of our hospitals across Virginia Beach are being rebranded. Um, same Sentara color and name, just a little different uh, spacing and font, a little different look. Uh, included in that is the opportunity to upgrade uh, two of our digital signs, one at Virginia Beach General and the subsequent agenda item at Sentara Independence with modern technology. These uh, digital signs not only provide uh, a landmark for these locations, but also provide educational and uh, informational assistance for uh, folks that may be passing by, including um, uh, virtual uh, uh, support for breast cancer, uh, educational services, uh, community wellness uh, screenings and events, uh, Medicare, Medicaid events, and other educational opportunities. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sierra. You also mentioned, just stay right there for a moment, our next agenda item, which was number 11, in which you're also representing. And just to, for the record, you do agree to all the conditions? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any opposition to items number 10 and 11 being on the consent agenda? Hearing none, Commissioner Mouch has agreed to read both of them into the record. You may be seated. The applicant seeks a change in nonconformity to replace and reconstruct the existing main entrance sign for the Sentara Hospital, which includes an existing legally nonconforming electronic display sign element. Hearing no opposition and a favorable staff recommendation, we find it acceptable to be placed on the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, that was the last items for the consent agenda. We will now place on the consent agenda applications number four, six, nine, 10, and 11. All right, thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion for consent as read by the vice chair? Yes, I move that the... I move that these items be approved by consent with the amended condition for the vinyl fence to be included in agenda number nine. Second. Second by Mr. Parks, is that correct? Mr. Plumley. Yep. 
Hippin, I'm sorry, Ms. Hippin. Second by Ms. Hippin. Is there anyone abstaining? Yes, I'm abstaining from items uh, 10 and 11 for the reasons set forth in a letter with the city attorney's office. All right, thank you. Um, I just realized I'd like to disclose that RMM does do business with uh, Centara, but I do not personally, so there should not be any uh, conflict of interest. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you. Votes open. Vote is now open. By a vote of 10 to, excuse me, 9 to 0 with one abstention on items 10 and 11. Items 4, 6, 9, 10, and 11 have been recommended for approval by consent. Okay, thank you. All right, if you had an application that was approved, if you could see your representative at the planning department, they'll let you know when you'll be in front of city council. Congratulations. We'll now move to the regular agenda. Madam Clerk, could we call the first agenda item? Our first agenda item is items number one, two, three, for Franklin Group Companies, LLC. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Rob Beeman. I'm a local land use attorney at the Troutman Pepper Law Firm here today on behalf of the applicant, Franklin Group Companies. Um, joining me this afternoon are several of the principals from Franklin Group, including Taylor Franklin, James Noel, Freddie Fletcher, and Murray Kirk. Um, first, I wanted to thank Kathy and Marshall and the rest of the staff for all their help with this application over the past several months. We certainly appreciate all their work on this application and the presentation that Marshall gave this morning to you in the informal session. I also wanted to thank uh, Karen Percillo and the Senior Housing Advisory Committee who have been great to work with and had a thorough sit down with us to go over the design and all the amenities that will be offered uh, with this uh, application. Um, uh, Marshall did a great job of kind of pointing out the highlights of the, of the application this morning, but there were a couple of key aspects of it that I wanted to highlight uh, for you this afternoon. Uh, the first one is that this property is unique. It is uh, approximately 6.8 acres that's located um, set back pretty far off Virginia Beach Boulevard behind the existing AAA office building and is currently zoned B2. It's surrounded on two sides by residential uses. And so given the fact that the adjacent uses are residential and it sits so far back off Virginia Beach Boulevard, the B2 zoning is probably not appropriate. It probably makes more sense for a residential zoning classification, which is what the applicant is proposing today. Secondly, uh, this project would fulfill two critical needs that have been identified even by city council for housing in the city. Uh, number one being uh, senior housing and the second being affordable housing. This project would be reserved for folks who are 62 years and, and older in age and would also 70% of the units would be reserved for folks who uh, qualify uh, under the income restrictions on the low income housing tax credit program. Um, the, the need for this type of housing in Virginia Beach is evidenced by one of the uh, applicants' other projects, which came through this commission a couple of years ago, has been completed and recently opened, at least up very, very quickly, and currently has a waiting list, I understand, from my client of almost 40 people, about 40 people, and they're turning away 20 to 25 others every month, just kind of demonstrates the need for this type of housing in Virginia Beach and specifically along this corridor. Um, like Birchwood, uh, this project would have a number of uh, kind of high-end amenities and high-end design. There'd be indoor and outdoor amenities, including fitness center, meeting space, and then also exterior on the exterior, there'd be um, pickleball courts, which are shown on the site plan, in addition to grilling areas and that sort of thing. Um, I also wanted to mention that the applicant has conducted extensive public outreach in connection with this application. Uh, we sent letters to each of the adjacent property owners, inviting them to a meeting at one of Franklin Group's other properties. And then additionally, we have fielded telephone calls from some of the adjacent property owners who weren't able to make that meeting, but have wanted to reach out and get additional information. And the feedback we've received so far has been very, very positive. Um, finally, I did want to touch on the subdivision variance. As part of this application, in addition to the rezoning, we're asking for a subdivision variance. The need for that is really generated by the unique dimensions of the site. It's exceptionally deep and exceptionally narrow. It's uh, 11 acres, but only 300 feet in width. And so that's really driving the need for a subdivision variance on this site. 
part of the city's consideration when it comes to subdivision variances. There's a there's a you know multi point test, and two of the the main considerations. Number one is it can't be of so general or recurring in nature that it's shared by a lot of properties in the vicinity. This is a really unique property that I haven't encountered in my career. Something similar to this in terms of the exceptional depth and width. Um, and then secondly, that it doesn't have any adverse effects. The variance wouldn't have any adverse effects on surrounding property owners. Not only would this application not have any adverse effects on the surrounding property owners, it would facilitate a more um, compatible zoning classification and more compatible use than the current B2 use of the property, which would allow for a myriad of, of commercial uses. So with that, we certainly thank you for your time and consideration of this application, and myself and our team will stand by for questions. Okay, um, do we have any uh, speakers? No, we do not have any speakers for this item. So we were asking to hear further requests of the commissioners. Okay, so you can just stay right there. Okay. All right, I'm gonna open the floor for questions from the commissioners. Mr. Bumley. Good afternoon, Mr. Beeman. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, can you address, there were some concerns brought up this morning about the traffic along that section of Virginia Beach Boulevard. Uh, our tra traffic engineer spoke to that issue in our informal session, but I think it's important sure. to highlight how, with regards to the, I think it's what, 5,400 trips a day anticipated from this new development, how is that going to be dealt with along Virginia Beach Boulevard? Yeah, no, that's right. So the, the current zoning classification of the property is B2, which would permit commercial uses, which generally generate far more traffic than any type of residential, multifamily residential, especially senior housing, which typically generates even less than, than typical apartments just because there's age restrictions on those. So compared to what's permitted by right on the property now, this use would, per, would um, provide for a fraction of the traffic that would currently be generated. And I think that's reflected, Marshall reflected that in the staff report as well. And you had discussed some of the amenities, pickleball courts, some of the interior amenities. How are people going to, or if they can, walk to Virginia Beach Boulevard if they want to use public transport from this location? Sure. There, there are uh, walking trails proposed and shown on the site plan around our building that actually connect to walking trails that are already on, or sidewalks that are already on the AAA office building piece. Where they don't fully connect to Virginia Beach Boulevard, we've shown additional connections to make sure that folks can walk all the way from our site all the way out to Virginia Beach Boulevard. Uh, and, and just for clarity on that point, because there are all these disclosures about AAA in, in, sure, the, sure. in the documentation, so there is an arrangement so those walkways can be used. I think I think that's important to clarify. That's correct. We are engaging with, in an ingress-egress easement that will include both pedestrian ingress and egress and vehicular e ingress and egress all the way out to Virginia Beach Boulevard. You had talked about the unusual shape of the parcel, you know, this is, in a lot of respects, you're kind of creating the need by proposing the project. In other words, the hardship doesn't exist until your application comes along. Can you kind of uh, further explain your position on that? I want to give you time to address that. Sure. With a, with a piece of property that's so long and so narrow, especially Zone B2 and with parts sitting so far off Virginia Beach Boulevard, and without a surrounding roadway corridor that's that's developed, very difficult to, to develop this property for one single use, and it really lends itself to multiple uses. And the only way practically to do that is to, to uh, subdivide the rear in order to allow for a residential use in the rear, which is compatible with those surrounding uses, while the front stays commercial, which is more appropriate along Virginia Beach Boulevard. So the only way to get street access is by having the variance. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Mons. Um, I believe that there's been an updated conceptual aerial um, that adds for a little bit more uh, tree canopy or, or barrier buffer between the, uh, the apartments adjacent to it. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. And I appreciate you asking that question. I wanted to put this on the record for the commission. I emailed Marcel yesterday afternoon about this, but we have been working with the property owner to the west, the apartment community, and have agreed to install additional landscaping over and above the Category 4 landscaping, which is shown on the site plan currently. And that would be evergreen landscaping, additional evergreen trees to provide a more opaque screen. And so we have informed uh, the adjacent property owner that we would be modifying the site plan between Planning Commission and City Council. I also did email that to Marshall, so it would be on the Planning uh, Department's official record, but I wanted to put it on the record before you today as well, so I appreciate the question. All right, thank you. Any other questions? 
All right, I see none. All right, have a seat. Thank you. This time I'm going to open it for discussion among, amongst the uh, commissioners. Is there anybody who'd like to say something? Mr. Plumley. Yeah, I, I would like to make a motion if it's appropriate this time. If we want a general discussion, I think we need these units. I think the applicant has done a good job. I, I frankly am encouraged by the additional buffer. I, I would just recommend if we do come around to agreeing to approve it that we add this language that specifically that the plan has been updated and that the staff be satisfied with the contents of the update before it's presented, that that's what we're recommending. So I, I would ask for that to be part of it if that's the inclination of, of the commission to approve it. Okay. Kaylin, you got that? Okay. Do I have, I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Parks. Is anybody abstaining? None? Is there any additional discussion? All right, seeing none, the vote's open. By a recorded vote of 10 to 0, items 1, 2, and 3, Franklin Group Companies LLC has been recommended for approval. Thank you. Next item. Our next item is item number 5, JD Enterprises, VA, LLC, DBA, Atlantic Rental Homes. Please come forward. Will you both be speaking? Just well, I mean, one at a time. Okay, just state state your name each before you talk. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you for the members of the Planning Commission to allow for allowing us to be here today. My name is Justin Taylor with JD Enterprises VA LLC, DBA Atlantic Rental Homes, and we are here seeking a conditional use permit for the property at 903 C Pacific Avenue in Virginia Beach. Okay, sir, would you like to say something? Just state your name. Yes, for the record, my name is Daniel Davis. Okay. Are you the owner? Uh, yes. Okay. Partner. All right. Uh, we did right. want. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We did want to mention um, for this particular property, we um, acknowledged that there was some concern about this address being advertised a little bit early before this process was complete, and we did want to sincerely apologize for that. Looking back, we see that that was an issue on our company's part, although there was some confusion on whether or not um, this property was grandfathered in or not. But again, we want to sincerely apologize for that and make sure it's known that that would not be an issue for our company moving forward. We hope the Planning Commission will take into consideration the fact that we have now met all of the requirements and that this property is in an area that's approved for short-term rentals and the majority of the units in this particular building are, or a lot of them are already used for short-term rentals. We also acknowledge that there was a concern about parking. Um, we know that there is one parking space per unit for this particular building. We also received the document from the Planning Commission saying that there is an exception that allows, um, even though this unit that has two bedrooms to only have one parking space, I guess that was an agreement that was made previously just based on the size of the area. There's only enough room for one parking space and there's a garage right next door where people can park if they have additional vehicles. So that really wouldn't be an issue whether we were approved or whether it was just a long-term resident moving into that space. And we do also hope that the Planning Commission will take our track record into consideration as a company that manages multiple short-term rentals in the overlay district and that has obtained now about 19 conditional use permits that are all in good standing. We definitely are willing to meet all of the city's guidelines and recommendations that have been put forth for short-term rentals. All right, any questions for the applicant? Mr. Plumley, yes, I get you. I do want to give you an opportunity to explain with a little more clarity how the mistake occurred because it's my understanding the city had notified you all that this conditional use permit was required, but it was after the notification of its requirement that it was advertised as a, a rentable unit under short-term rental terms. So I'm I'm a little confused as to how that confusion cropped up. Maybe it was. Left hand not talking to the right hand, I don't know, but I'd, I want to give you an opportunity to sort of explain the details more fully, if you could. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so when we got this property last year, um, the previous owner had let us know he had been managing short-term rentals there for about five years or so, and that he believed it was grandfathered in. Um, from our experience, when that is the case, it's a pretty quick process to get your short-term rental permit if you're 
not having to go through the whole process of getting a conditional use permit. We had another property um, at 304 28th Street the year before. We did that same process and it was all approved rather quickly. Um, I wanted to mention that when we did reach out to the city uh, with zoning, multiple members told us, yes, you are correct. This property is grandfathered in and they actually issued us a short term rental permit for this property by email. A few days later, they came back and said, we're so sorry, there has been a mistake. This property is not grandfathered in and we're gonna have to take this permit back. So that was something that was a little confusing. But again, we do acknowledge that before we ever advertise this property, we should have done our due diligence to make sure that we did have our own permit with our own name on it. So again, we do apologize and moving forward, we'll make sure we won't have that issue again. Ms. Potter. So I appreciate that partial explanation, but I am concerned because the staff has basically a policy that if you're non-compliant before you ever apply, then we don't generally recommend approval because we don't want an enforcement problem later. So if you don't follow the rules beforehand, perhaps you won't follow the rules afterwards. But you tell me you thought you were grandfathered in. Is there any way you can alleviate my concerns that in fact it was an oversight that you advertised after you were told you were not grandfathered? Um, so I believe at that point our listing had been taken down. Um, I don't want to get too confused with the timeline. Again, we, we do apologize for having listed it early. Um, our listing has been taken down and we've been waiting for the opportunity to go through this process. Again, it, it definitely was an oversight on our part. Um, we thought it was grandfathered in. The, the previous owner had made it seem that way and said that they didn't have any issues. And again, we should have just waited to make sure that that was all sealed up. But again, we hope the Planning Commission will take our track record as a company that has been managing multiple properties in the overlay district in good standing for several years now. Again, we have multiple conditional use permits. So we are aware of the process. We are doing things, uh, trying our best to comply with all the regulations. We certainly don't wanna have any issues with the city of Virginia Beach and are trying to do the exact opposite and hopefully can be an example of a company that has continues to successfully manage short-term rentals within the city. So after you were told that they were incorrect mm -hmm. when they told you it was grandfathered. And in fact, it was not grandfathered. So then you didn't renew an ad or initiate another ad? Correct, our listing was taken down. We have it not was. advertised for short-term rentals. Okay, then. thank you, I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to clarify that point too, because now I'm a little confused, because I thought when you contacted the city and the city said, Yes, you are grandfathered. You you heard that from a city staff member. That's what I heard you say. Is that accurate? I just want to because I I thought you indicated you contacted zoning or someone and they told you that it was in fact a grandfathered property. In my understanding, that yes, correctly? they did say that it was grandfathered in, and they actually issued us a short terminal permit. And you, and you got that, and so at, at that point, that's when you re-advertised it as opening, is that Yes, that's fair? correct, yes sir. Even even though you had been told previously by staff that you needed a conditional use permit. I just wanna make sure, I'm, I'm not really understanding the timing of how that came across, but I think it's important to kind of try to clear this up if we can. Okay, so again, basically um, when we got the property, we were told by the previous owner that they believed it was grandfathered in and because we had gone through that process before where you, we were able to get a short term rental permit pretty quickly, um, we did move a little too quickly and advertised it before we got the um, yay or nay from zoning that it was actually grandfathered in. When we did reach out to them, they said yes it was and they did issue the short term rental permit. Um, then they came back and said we've made a mistake, it's not, we have to take it back and we took the listing down. And then did it again get advertised? No, it did not, it has not been okay. advertised again since then. Okay, all right. That's where I was confused and looking at the timeline that we had from the staff report. Okay. Commissioner Byler and uh, Plumley, if I could ask staff to go ahead and tell me and tell us what that current violation is right now and the dates that are on that, please. 
So I don't know if Kevin wants to speak to this. Typically, it's our practice that if there is an open violation for a short-term rental, it remains open until the CUP is approved. Simply filing for a CUP hasn't corrected the violation because we don't know what the outcome of the CUP will be. So we leave it open until the CUP is approved. So what is the date of that violation? The formal notification, I guess, is what I'm asking. We're trying to put our timeline together to make sure that- It looks like the notice of violation was issued on September 18th of this year. So that came after the second, the way it's in the staff report is the inspection happened on the 27th of August. They then deactivated the next day, but then subsequently reactivated on September 4th. And you're saying the notice of violation went out on the 18th of September, is that? That's correct. That's what I'm seeing in our system. Okay. Mr. Palmy, does that answer your question? Ms. Byler? So I guess when you advertise, it's not automatic that you're advertising for immediate occupancy. So you could be advertising saying this would be available hypothetically November 1 or some other time. Right, but we, uh, we acknowledge that that is still would be considered a compliance issue that you're not supposed to advertise at all. So that was our mistake. And again, we do sincerely apologize for that. So the city is saying that you put in a new ad after you had been told that it was not grandfathered and your short-term rental application or permit had been revoked. No, I'll speak on that. So when the was denied or the application um, when they said that it was not in compliance, um, we did change it to 30 days or more, um, for, starting for October. For September, for that calendar, unfortunately, that wasn't edited or wasn't um, changed. And so that's why it looked like it was open. But moving forward from October 1 and uh, moving forward, it was all 30 days or more. So I hope that's not confusing. They, they do allow you to have your listing up if it's for 30 days or more. But if it's less than 30 days, it's considered short-term rentals, which it would be a compliance issue. So I know that sounds, it's probably getting a little confusing, but. So your advertisement was for 30 days, is what you're saying? Yes. Uh, the one that October you got a violation one. on? No, the, first, okay. the violation was for short-term. Then that was changed to only 30 days or more. Okay. Mr. Palmy, I'm sorry. You got this? <laughs> yeah. No. Um, but it, it did go back to short term after we got the permit that was issued to us because we're thinking at that point we're okay. When they went back and said, sorry, we've made a mistake, we did have to remove the, the short term rental list. And did that phone call occur after the inspection by the city and before you reactivated on the 4th of September? Is that when you learned from the city you believed that you were in compliance? Is that, that's an important moment to understand when that call happened. Um, we don't have the, the dates when that call happened, but that sounds correct. Ms. Byler? Well, I'm convinced that there was a confusing situation and that we representing the city were at least a part of the confusion. And I'm sorry for any part that the city played in that. It sounds to me like you were trying earnestly to, to be compliant. And if you have a track record on other properties and no violations on those, it does speak to the manner in which you conduct your business. Have you had any other uh, violations on the other properties you manage? Um, yes, recently for 516 19th Street, uh, Unit 3A, um, that was not renewed, um, I guess the expiration date, and then they contacted us, say, hey, this expired, you'll need to renew your zoning permit. And so since then, we removed that listing, and then we're in the process now of getting the renewal. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Monch? So just for clarification, <clears throat> Are you currently advertised for a short-term rental right now? No, sir. Okay. And does the city have a way to know, uh, this is just for staff, sorry, uh, whether it's correct, is that correct or not? It is listed as a 30-day plus rental. <coughs> okay. 
All right. Any other questions, Mr. Byler? Plumley. That's okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be Mr. Byler. It's fine. Um, yeah. um, and then Commissioner. So, Anthony. I think what you meant to say, you weren't violated on that other property. That's not a violation. It sounds you notified that it had expired. You had not received a notice of violation. I just want to make it clear that there wasn't another violation out there. That's oh, what yes. the question was. I'm sorry. I just wanted to bring that up anyway. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Hippen. Okay. I think, I think we got it straight, but I was making sure. So... You bought the property. You were told by the previous owner, hey, this is grandfather. So you advertised it. Yes, ma'am. You were told by the city, yes, it's grandfather. Then you were told by the city, no, it's not. You removed the advertisement for, 30, for less than 30 days, for short term. But you advertised it as a long term. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. OK. All right, so the current advertisement that you have on it is a long-term advertisement. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you do not have any other violations, correct or not correct? Correct. Okay, so your tickler is set up so that you don't have to go through this again, right? Right. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Mr. Monch and then Mr. Cromwell. I, just from staff's opinion, does that timeline sound correct? That Ms. Hippen just asked. Want me to say it again? This one is just, there's a lot involved with this and this one. So initially, as he mentioned, reached out to our staff in the zoning division for an STR permit. It was issued in error. That permit was then voided. They were told they needed to come through the conditional use permit process. At that time, they were told you cannot list or rent this unit as a short-term rental until you go through the CUP process. Based on our research and using host compliance, the listing was deactivated. Let me just get the date here. On August 28th, 2024, but then we do show that it was subsequently reactivated on September 4th with documented stays having taken place since then. We did check. Now it is up there as a long-term, so 30-day plus rental. Thank you, Mr. Mosh. Mr. Cromwell. You all said you just came into possession of this. You bought it recently. Is that correct? Um, this, this summer. This summer. Okay. Would the previous conditions that it was not in the short-term rental? When that shouldn't that have been disclosed in the closing documents that you when you bought the property? Well, that was part of the confusion. The previous owner had shown us that he had been operating as a short term rental for about five years and said he did not have any issues and believed it was grandfathered in. Now we should have done our due diligence to make sure that was correct and make sure that we also have our own permit and our our own company's name first before doing anything. So that was really the first main oversight that we made, and we do apologize for that. Thank you. All right, Ms. Crum, everybody else? All right, gentlemen, I guess you can see that the concern here is that we make sure that short-term rentals are in compliance. Yes, sir. And if they're not, there is a process. It hasn't been done yet, but there's a revocation that can happen. So anyway, I don't know which way it's going to go, but I'm, I'm going to close it right now. We're going to go into discussion and maybe a vote, and then we'll go from there. So good luck. Was there someone who was going to voice an objection? I thought that was brought up at the... Um... And for I asked for speakers, and there were none. There were no speakers. Okay. We just had the letter, but no speaker signed up for today. Okay. Thank you. And again, Thank the letter you. was about the parking situation. So as we explained, that really wouldn't change regardless if it's short term or long term. There's only one parking space available at that building um, for each address, and then there's a parking garage right next door where people can park sure. additional vehicles. All right. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, I open it for a discussion. If there is any, or if not. A motion? Ms. Hilton. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna just take a swag at this here. Um, it seems that um, these gentlemen purchased a property and they were given bad information by the previous owners. Then they got 
a mistaken certificate from the city and they've stopped advertising. My only question is that there were subsequent stays during this time. Were they short-term stays or long-term stays? Based on the information we have, there were documented short-term rental stays in September after they were notified of the need for the conditional use permit. Okay. Um, yeah, um, okay. I, I would say that the due diligence part is, is the issue. So are you making a motion? Or is there any more discussion? Mr. Mons. Um <clears throat> Coming into it, reading all the stuff that we had, uh, I was under the impression that it was a clear violation and kind of knowingly. Um, I, don't, I don't really know if it's the case. Uh, as black and white as what is on the paper. Um, so I'm, I'm a little conflicted. I was thinking one thing and I might be thinking something different now. Uh, I'm not willing to put a motion on the table, but um, I wanted to voice that just because there was a lot of confusion with this one. And uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. All right, thank you. Any other comments? Ms. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I feel like there's a responsibility on the part of the city as much as there is on the owner and that th there was misinformation shared to the applicant that makes me pause to reflect on how we as a city can best serve our citizens when it comes to these grandfathering clauses for short-term rentals. So that's something that I'm learning in this process as to how that's best managed. I feel the applicant was humble today in earnest and that our city council has put in these opportunities for short-term rentals. Um, and this is just a little more complicated than I expected. Okay. Ms. Quayler? What? <laughs> Hi, Commissioner Byler here. <laughs> um, We're going to have to correct these minutes. You know that. Yes, this Byler speaking right now. <laughs> I appreciate everything that's been said. <laughs> and, you know, I've had issues with the way the city has handled compliance on short term rentals before because we've been understaffed. And I've sympathized with neighbors who have put up with undocumented short term rentals or too many people or too loud parties. And we're, tr we're working on that. But the possible non compliance issue today doesn't fall into any of those categories in my mind. This seems like administrative error, nothing more, nothing less, and we were a part of it. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve the application. All right, a motion by Ms. Byler. Second. Second by Mr. Anderson. Ms. Quayler, yeah. So open for a discussion. Mr. Mott. Quickly, if I could ask a question. Um, with the most recent stays, do we know if uh, they are registered with the Commissioner of the Revenue? Um, and have the transient occupancy taxes been paid for those? Um, yes, yeah, so they, they have been registered and paying o transient occupancy taxes with the Commissioner of Revenue since February of 2019. So that's why for the grandfather date, that's as of July 1, 2018. So they have been paying and they just didn't meet that cutoff for the grandfather status. Okay, thank you, that was helpful. Yes, no, I made a mistake. All right, no more discussion, the vote's open. Commissioner Alcaraz. It doesn't give me a, it doesn't give me a motion. It doesn't give me, it's not asking me. Um, okay. Sorry, we'll just need a verbal vote from you then. Commissioner yes. Alcaraz. Okay. Okay. Um, by a vote of eight to two, the, or excuse me, by a recorded vote of eight to two, Item number five, JD Enterprises VA LLC DBA Atlantic Rental Homes has been recommended for approval. Guys, congrats, just stay in compliance. Next agenda item. 
Our next agenda item is item number seven, Grace Bible Church of Virginia Beach, Inc. Good afternoon, Chairman Alcarez, members of the commission, Eddie Berdon, Virginia Beach Attorney representing Grace Bible Church. Before I get into this application, um, I want to just follow on to what you all just discussed. And it's not, not the city's fault. Ms. Byler is absolutely right. Uh, but because we do a lot of real estate, as you all know, and we get there's been, there's been a lot of confusion with these what's grandfathered and what's not. I can't scores of calls over the last five years from people and from my associates and partners about it. And I, I think staff's doing the best they can and it's getting better. Uh, but it is it's fraught with these kinds of errors. People think they're grandfathered and they're not. And it, it, it isn't isolated. It's a, it, there's a lot of it out there. And I think most of it's been handled at this point. But, um, you know, the, I, I think you're all correct. I think these people are earnestly trying and it is confusing. So anyway, sorry to get off on a tangent. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which district do you represent? <laughs> <laughs> not, not a one. <laughs> and I stayed out of the short term rental thing from the beginning to the end and because it, it is an administrative and extent. It's not a criticism of the, of the staff. It's an administrative, I don't want to say nightmare, but it's a, it's a lot to handle. And, and I think we all know that. So, um, and I, I, I understand exactly what, what the commission interest is uh, on this. Okay, Th this particular application, I've been involved with this since 2017. The Smith family um, uh, owned this property for 60 plus years. Properties all around it developed residentially. Uh, and then the Oceana circumstance, the BRAC circumstance all came about. Um, and they are stuck with their, they were stuck with the 60 acres in the middle of a residential area that can't be developed with anything residential on it. Um, Grace Bible came along. Uh, the, the property had been marketed for a long, long time. It's really not a great location for commercial. Um, and they, they uh, in 2017, came in. Uh, got It's all zoned agriculture, by the way. It's all of it today, including the quote-unquote out parcels of the two parcels on uh, London Bridge Road are all zoned agriculture. Anyway, it's 2017, came in, got a conditional use permit. Did, they did seek B1A zoning on the two out parcels and withdrew that because of, of their being opposition to it. And then um, got caught up in the uh, stormwater modeling and our, our updated and much, much uh, uh, heralded, for good reason, stormwater uh, policy changes. Well, turns out that London Bridge Road, when it was widened back in the in the early 90s, it was a VDOT project. Um, they didn't do a real good job with the stormwater. And the modeling shows that during significant rain events, uh, public water out of the London Bridge Road drainage system dumps on this property. And we heard that back in 2017 and 2021 from the folks in Pine Ridge um, who the, the engineering for that subdivision um, left a little bit to be desired back in the 70s, too. So um, the in 21, the church came in with a modification to, to put a bunch of underground storage uh, on the property and build a large church. Uh, the, the reality is it's not economically feasible. And, and, and the city, city staff, been, this isn't a criticism, but they've been helpful throughout the process. Um, and, and recognize that what I'm saying is, is accurate. But now, because of you know, just economic reality of what that all would have cost, we're scaling back on the plans and you know, pushing the, uh, the building closer to London Bridge Road, less impervious surface, reducing the size of the, uh, of the church and the size of the parking significantly. Uh, we've met with the, the neighbors in the, uh, to our south um, and southeast, and. You know, there's no objection. They were supportive of the original application, which larger church closer to their neighborhood. We've kept the, the buffer that we um, had as a condition back then. Uh, so this really is just a downsizing to make it economically feasible. Uh, we don't know that there'll be any assistance um, from the city. There is a, there is a, um, a fund that the city has started and will continue to add to it, hopefully every year, to help with situations like this where you know, property owner didn't have anything to do with creating the problem, but there's a problem with the drainage from public water coming on to private property. 
And I'll also note that there's a significant wooded section of this property. There's also a wooded section of the out parcel in front on the western side of it that's um, not being touched. Um, and that really, um, hopefully soon, um, with some state enabling legislation, can be given some stormwater credit because it does help from the stormwater standpoint to have a substantial forested area that is not being developed. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as... Um, Alexis, who's done an excellent job, and we compliment her on, on all of her work on this request. She said in, in the staff report, uh, there's really nothing but a downsizing that's taking place here. I will mention that the frontage um, of this piece of property is 160 feet on uh, London Bridge Road. Uh, the, Mr. Mark's concern about the sign, um, it was it's been a condition all along that it'd be no more than eight feet in height, and there is the ability, if it, if if in fact the elevation of the ground um, is below the road, we can certainly uh, do some you know, filling a little bit and, and raise it up so it's, um, it's visible, but we're perfectly fine, have been perfectly fine with the eight foot height all along. And the conditions as recommended are all acceptable to, uh, to the church. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, Ms. Parks. Mr. Burdon, the uh, landscaping on the new plan is even more so on the the baseball tip. The it, correct. Yeah, it's, I don't. I, that particular doesn't show the landscape buffer. But that, there, that's it, the twenty one plan, right? Or is that the the current one that's no, on that's, the that's the that's the current plan. The twenty one okay. plan. The building, everything was was further back, closer to that tip, and and but the that's there you go. There, that's the landscape plan from twenty one, which you're keeping on this plan. Thank you. All right. Do we have speakers? Is there WebEx? We have one person um, that wants to speak it in person. All right, Mr. Don, we'll call you back up. Thank you. Call the speaker. Um, if Michelle Cleland could speak, please come up for speaking. Item agenda number seven. Afternoon. You just state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Michelle Cleland, and I'm the adjacent property owner um, at 2285 London Bridge. Um, I actually have a lot of frontage on London Bridge that does not drain well, um, as opposed to just the 120 feet that the church does. So I'm actually the parcel that is between their driveway and Pine Ridge. Um, the modification that is presented does not address how the substantial runoff from the proposed parking lot directly abutting my property, as well as from the proposed entranceway will be handled. I rec also request language be included in the permit conditions that will restrict project creep, in that additional facilities will not be added piecemeal in the future as a way to circumvent the original stormwater design. So I respectfully ask for you to defer your vote on the CUP modification until stormwater impacts to my property are addressed and verbiage is to restrict future expansion is added. The current staff report itself notes that one of the reasons for recommend, their recommending approval is that the project's modified orientation pushes it closer to London Bridge and away from the residences. Well, this is closer to me and I do not feel that the impacts to my property that I've paid taxes on since I purchased it in 23 have been evaluated as carefully during this review as impacts to the residences during previous reviews. For example, where the adjacent parking lot is proposed, the current grade slopes down from the center of that field towards my property. The permit condition number 10 states that parking lots, which have now been shifted, quote, must be at current grade to adjacent properties. This concerns me greatly. What strategy is proposed to handle the significant parking lot runoff and is it adequate? My pasture that abuts the proposed large entrance driveway is also at risk if the entrance is not designed properly. Inadequate stormwater management will flood me out and significantly degrade the value and use of my current property, uh, currently and in the future. So I hope you understand my high level of concern. And I wasn't here for the several go rounds. So if you're hearing this for the first time, there was nobody to speak about this parcel previously. 
The response to my questions from the stormwater team was basically that details are not required at this time as this is a conceptual plan. However, I don't see a conceptual plan here that addresses all of the runoff from this project, only that portion affecting the residences. The stormwater ponds will not be handling all runoff, so what will? I believe this is a fair question. This part of the project should not be an afterthought as there is significant drainage that is not being directed toward the conceptual stormwater ponds. Condition number eight requires conformance to this conceptual plan, but this plan is incomplete as presented in my opinion. I'm not anti-project and I sympathize with what the church has been going through for these last several years. And I look forward to good neighbors. I just want a project where all the impacts have been reviewed, project creep will not occur, and it can be done right the first time. Thank you. That concludes your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. I, I do have a question for Mr. Plumley. Yes. Sorry. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry. I, is your home on this plan that we're looking there's at? No residents on this, there's no residents allowed. Um, Come to the mic, man. I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> There's no residents allowed by proffer on this. I use this property um, for agricultural purposes. Okay. Um, so I do, I have poultry, I have beehives. Um, I do have a conditional use permit myself um, for wildlife rehabilitation, and it's all done with within the boundaries. Was that recent? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I recently, we approved the fox and the hen question. Yeah. 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 Um, if you have any questions on that, I'll. I I'll do. <laughs> Let me. Can I ask you as a follow up? Mm -hmm. And I, no question you have is unreasonable. Okay. Thank you. Are you having flooding now in that location, and where would it occur? Um, roughly. I would not actually term it flooding. Um, I do feel that this area was all a floodplain to begin with, so I think it's functioning that way. Um, when I do get significant rainfall, actually it doesn't even have to be this, that significant, you can have water ponding on the surface, but then it is it infiltrates. So I do not have major flooding at this time on this property. I'm able to use it exactly how, it, how I need to use it. So my biggest concern is that parking lot boundary because everything, you've got an acre of impervious surface that's sloping down towards my property line. So I've not heard any objection to the use generally. It's strictly the, the potential for right. additional and, runoff. And the way this is presented, at least it was to me, is that y'all are going to be voting on a conceptual plan. And I don't see any details. There's actually, and it's been very interesting looking at the other projects that have been presented before this. Are there going to be ditches? I mean, are there conveyances? Are there underground? I, I mean, I just think to wait till after the fact, I, and this is my only opportunity for public comment, I believe that I, I also, I saw what happened at Sherwood Lakes and to have to, see that there are mistakes or oversights that are done and the city has to go in and put a multi-million dollar right. pump station in because suddenly I've got f three feet of water standing in my and, Mis and Mr. Dunn's property next to me because really I don't see where conceptually, how is that runoff handled? Have, have you been in touch with the stormwater department here? So you've, you've voiced asked, this concern with them I directly. Did, and I was and told that and you know you want they you were informed that after today's meeting you would have a chance to participate in discussions with them return calls to them follow up with them if there is a problem caused by this were you informed of that no i was not no, I, was I don't know if your separate. ducks will mind the additional water uh, uh, um, <laughs> but i think we can ask the applicant to address some of your concerns i really appreciate it thank you okay thank you thank you thank any other questions mr Monts? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> i don't think this is necessarily a question for you i, I appreciate you coming up and, and addressing this concern specifically because a lot of it has to do with what we talked about in the informal session which unfortunately unless you're there you don't get a chance to see it um so uh, these questions hopefully can be answered uh, through the conversations that we have in our informal. Oh, good. But um, <laughs> we are also not privy to seeing the finalized um, stormwater management 
uh, that goes on. Um, so we have to take the same as you, the city's word, that they're gonna be doing their job, that the developers are gonna be developing it appropriately to the standards that are set. Um, and so we have full faith in our city to do that. Understandably, things have happened in the past, um, but moving forward, we have standards that are set and it's one of the most stringent stormwater standards uh, in our country. Um, so I have full faith that if this project is to go through, that uh, the stormwater standards would be adhered to. Um, with that being said, you know, I, I do think that we need to make sure that runoff, if there is any, which there won't because 100% of your water that is supposed to be retained on site. But um, it would be nice to, to have continued conversations with the city to make sure that the plans are just that. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Parks, hold on, one more question. Oh, and I just wanted to let you know too that this isn't your last chance to make public comment because this will go before city council as well. So that'll be another opportunity to then make whatever comments you, you need to make then too. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you and be seated. Mr. Bedon. I appreciate Ms. Cleland coming down. Uh, the models have been run on the previous larger plan, and they clearly, and, and Mr. Moss is absolutely correct, um, we cannot um, discharge any water beyond what is currently coming off the property now with no development. Um, and the water that is coming off the property today with no development is going to the south. It's not going uphill to London Bridge Road. And during a 100-year storm, the, pub, the, the, the drains that are there on the south side of London Bridge Road adjacent to what was Mrs. Smith's property, water is coming out of those, not going into those. All right, so our drainage will go to BMPs that are depicted on here, could, could be larger. There's plenty of room. We won't be going into the woods, which we're getting no credit for keeping that as it is for which water does go into there as well from London Bridge Road in a 100-year storm. But, um, we have no issues whatsoever with regard to we will not be putting water onto Ms. Cleland's property. It will not drain onto her property from this, period. And right. with that, all the conditions that are in the staff recommendation are um, acceptable for the client. Any other questions for Mr. Badon? Uh, Mr. Parks. Not so much a question. I just wanted to make a statement that we talked about in the informal, and I think Commissioner Mach talk, touched on it. This will be stamped by a professional engineer at the end of this job. It's not going to be an afterthought. It's just at this stage, it's conceptual. Lawyers don't count. Eddie. You can't stamp it. You understand that. <laughs> no, no, I absolutely know that. <laughs> but I listen to but, those engineers. But it will be stamped by a licensed professional to ensure that water is not being drained yes, across I, the if, property. If, if, I, if I indicated I was going to put a stamp on it, I, I, I have no stamp to put on it. But, but that's, what, that's what we have engineers for who are very familiar, have been familiar with this since the beginning. No other questions. You can be seated right now. We'll close it and open it up for discussion if there are any comments. Mr. Plumley. I would like to make a motion. Um, I think the issue of stormwater in this city is of extremely high importance, and we have a wonderful professional staff of folks who work very diligently to try to prevent runoff. Um, the people understand in our state, it's a um, common enemy doctrine with runoff. It's your problem, okay? That's what the common law of our state says. So we depend on the city saying, that might be the common law of our state, but we're going to assure we're not approving a plan that does not take this water and prevent it from becoming the burden of our neighbors. So that's why I have faith in this. And so I'd like to make the motion to approve it. It is a reduction in the size of this building. It is a reduction in the amount of impervious service. So you will be benefited by this being approved as opposed to what was previously approved. So I want to make that point. I have a motion by Mr. Plumley, second by Mr. Monch. Is there anybody abstaining? None? 
Any other additional comments or discussion? None. Okay, we're open for vote. I'm not getting a screen to vote. Okay, um, we'll just do a verbal vote, Commissioner Alcaraz. Yes. Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 0, item number 7, Grace Bible Church of Virginia Beach, Inc. has been recommended for approval. All right, thank you. Next item. Item on number 8, Charles Young. Afternoon, sir. Will you just state your name? Yeah, I'm Charles Young. I'm applying for a conditional use permit on 933D Pacific Avenue. Okay. Want to take any information that we need to know so we can vote on you? Um, kind of new. I don't oh, sure. Know much what else is to say, so I'm here to. Okay. Is there any opposition here? None? No. So just stay right there. We're going to have the commissioners ask you any questions if there are any. Any commissioners want to ask any questions? Mr. Plumley. Yes, um, Mr. Young, there appears to have been an ongoing operation at the time the city conducted the inspection. Um, there was an ongoing short-term rental. Was that, is that accurate? Yes, sir. Did you, what was your understanding at that point uh, with regards to um, your ability to be operating short-term rental? Okay, yeah, if I, I uh, have you know, thought I was grandfathered in from, you know, from when I first um, purchased the place as far as our whole building I was grandfathered in at Pacific Place. Um, so I rented it out uh, right away. A family member of ours, um, like a few months ago, purchased a rental as well because we were doing pretty good. And they notified or told us that you had to have a permit. So that's when we applied for one. And then we got the email saying that, um, you know, we had to, uh, we actually, we had to, a couple applications because we put it in the wrong way. Um, we got an email stating that we had to take it down and we got that email that we ended up taking the listing down. We got the email stating that. Um, so that's kind of where we're at right now, trying to make everything right. And, and so you had owned it for how long before this I've owned the property since 2020, I believe. And so you had operated short-term rental throughout that entire period? Is that fair? On and off, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you had any other violations? Well, let me ask you this. Do you have any other short-term rental properties that you manage other than this location? Um, I don't manage them. I do have some, but they're in the Outer Banks. Okay. Have you ever been cited for a violation for noise or parties or, you know, no, neighbors sir. upset with activities, anything like that? No, sir. Not to this point. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Sir, um, so you manage this, these your property and the one in Outer Banks. Do you live here locally? I live in Chesapeake, Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you, if there's any problem, you can be there, as, as it's stated. If, okay. if there's ever a problem... Oh, if there's a problem with the property, oh yeah, I yeah. live you know thirty minutes from the property. I work ten minutes uh, from the property, you know, Monday through Friday. So, um, and I do the same thing in the Outer Banks as well. If there's an issue, I actually drive hour down there, take care of things right away. So, did you I go get? Myself. Did you go apply for the application before you got the violation? Before I got the violation. You said you asked your friend or our family. No, I asked. If, no, the family member bought one and said, and they applied and said that we weren't, you weren't grandfathered, and that we had to get one. And I tried to argue with them about it, but they said we had to get one. So that's when we agree, applied. And so you applied, and then you got a violation after you applied. Uh, we got an email saying I, I don't haven't gotten a violation. Okay. All right. It was an email from. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Anybody else? All right, thank you, sir. You can be seated. Thank you. Open it up for a discussion. Mr. Public. I didn't vote to approve the last one in this location because I wasn't sure what we were going to hear on the second one. And I didn't want to rush in to a recommendation on the first, not getting a sense of both of them because they're in the same building. I mean, this is, this is the same place. And so it's kind of an unusual situation like that. But... This sort of, um, you know, 
I guess, narrative about how things begin, there does appear to be confusion in it. This is not the nature of a violation of throwing parties with 200 people and, you know, somebody injured or anything like that. This is, this is getting permitted and coming in. So I think hearing this, I would go back and reverse my vote and support that one because I want people coming in and getting their approval and getting into the system. This has been an area designated for this use. We put them through all the strictures of what they can do and can't do and how many parking spaces and all that. So for that reason, and I wanted to explain the difference, um, um, I would move to approve it. All right, before I go, Mr. Parks would like to say something. Yeah. Brian couldn't have said it any better for me, too. I was the same way when I voted on the previous. And hearing both, I would also probably change my vote, knowing now these the same circumstances and that it seems to be pretty commonplace that folks seem to think this is grandfathered in when it's really not. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Plumley. Do I have a second? Second, second by Mr. Parks. Is there any additional com comments or discussion? None, we'll open the vote. Commissioner Alcaraz will do a verbal vote. Yes. Thank you. By recorded vote of 10 to zero, item number eight, Charles Young has been recommended for approval. Thank you, sir. Next item. Uh, item number 12, CNC Development Company. John Alcaraz, members of the commission, Eddie Bredon, Virginia's attorney representing CNC. Uh, both Chris and Michael Edel uh, are here with us this afternoon. Um, we'll pass on, there's a letters of support from uh, the residents who live uh, directly across 65th Street on the south side uh, and the uh, property uh, abutting the property uh, on the north side. <coughs> excuse me, of, of the Sudbury property. As uh, Aubrey indicated in the um, informal and his staff report, and appreciate Aubrey's work on this uh, application, the, the, the property today um, consists of two uh, 50 by 150 foot lots that front on the feeder road, uh, the corner lot being non-conforming, and it's lot width to today's requirements for lot width that didn't exist when the entirety of the north end was subdivided. On those two lots, there exist today two duplexes, a total of four residential units uh, that have uh, been there for uh, some 60 plus years. The properties as they currently exist can be redeveloped with either two duplexes, because they're legally non-conforming duplex lots, uh, or with four standalone units uh, under the Old Beach, excuse me, the Old Beach. That's where it started, but now it's also at the North End, the North End Overlay uh, District. And my clients who've done this uh, previously at the, the North End and the North End um, Civic League, in my 40 years of doing this has always been uh, very favorable to reducing density and doing single family uh, homes on these non-conforming lots, which in this case, we're, we're, our lots are, uh, the two interior lots or the western two lots are completely conforming. And the corner lot is conforming, except for the fact that today's ordinance requires a 60 foot wide uh, lot in this district and in, in other districts. Um, that's similar 10 foot or 10% additional in the corner. And that's because, and that's there for one reason, because the, the subdivision ordinance anticipates that all the residential streets will be 50 feet wide with a 30 foot pavement section. And so the intent being that when you have a corner lot, you have, you have two streets and the same would be true on the side as well as in the front. <clears throat> At the north end, however, we have a lot of roads that are planted a whole lot wider uh, than 50 feet. And at the north end, there've been, uh, uh, over, over the years, scores and scores of variances on corner lots because 95% of them are 50 foot wide. 
And so you have a situation where there is a hardship and there is basis for granting a variance. Um, and that would that would be the case with regard to the corner lot that is the subject of this application today. Uh, and when we met with the North End Civic League Zoning and Land Use Subcommittee and went through all this, they recognized that, hey, we grant that side yard adjacent uh, variance all the time. And this is less of a variance uh, for that, and that will go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. You all aren't voting on that today than what is routinely recommended and routinely um, approved at the north end of Virginia Beach, and also along some of the subdivisions in Shore Drive and Croatan, a little bit different situation. We have the same thing, 50-foot lots in the R10 district that are corner lots. It's a very common situation. It's why we have a Board of Zoning Appeals. The, <coughs> excuse me, so, but the lots that we're proposing are completely in character with the north end, and the only one that requires this variance, the subdivision variance, is the corner lot, and it goes from the current corner lot oriented east-west rather than north-south, um, <clears throat> that's only 50 feet wide upon which we can build a duplex. So this get with the subdivision, the duplex nonconformity goes away completely. All that can be built on these three lots are single-family homes on each one because that existing legal nonconformity disappears when the property is resubdivided. That goes away entirely. It doesn't have to be a condition. That's the law. So what this achieves is three single-family homes on two lots that are 100% conforming, another lot that is conforming to the character of the north end without a doubt, <clears throat> but it doesn't have 60 feet of width. If it had 60 feet of width, it would be the exception. It would be the irregular, the non-conforming, because it's not what's at the north end. And it's, again, same is true with Croatan and a lot of the subdivisions uh, that were done back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, before we had zoning in 1954. So that's why the, this is not the situation that existed on 73rd Street, which some of you may or may not know about, and I'm not gonna go into all that, but th that's a situation that's caused some, some concerns at the north end, and I'm not gonna go down that road, but it was a situation where 30-foot lots and trying to make them 40-foot lots, the Civic League decided that wasn't a good idea, and that, that's not an argument about that. But this is a situation that is 100% a good idea because it's doing what the character of the neighborhood is. And that's 50 foot lots, whether they be corner or not. And the conditions as recommended by staff are acceptable to uh, the applicants and be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Bedon? Mr. Plumley? Thank you for that and making it clear the reason why this is a reduction is because you cannot build duplexes going further, going after this. Correct. It cannot be done. Absolutely cannot be done. Once the subdivision goes to record, you cannot build a duplex on any of these lots. The only lots that, and there are, there are a ton of them at the north end that have duplexes on them that are non-conforming, but they existed before we had zoning. And that's why they continue and can continue. And that includes the property that is directly to the west of us. Now, I will say this, that, 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 uh, Chris and Michael had spoken to the, the folks who are recent um, purchasers of that duplex, um, and we hope that with a better understanding of what this is, that they will not have the objection that they've raised, but their property has a duplex on it. It's an old one. It can be torn down and a larger one built, um, and that lot is the same as the two lots, the one next to her, theirs and the one east of that. And those lots will be developed with a single family home that will meet every zoning requirement. Now, that, those two lots are not the subject of this application. Therefore, technically, legally, you can't make that a condition. But we're telling you, I mean, we've told us civically, it's no, there's, the BZA wouldn't grant us a variance on either of those two lots. Both of those houses will ac access from 65th Street, just like everybody else on 65th Street. Nothing different than anybody else on 65th Street. And they'll have single family homes on them that will meet every setback requirement lot coverage restriction, and the North End is the only place in the city of Virginia Beach, R5R at the North End, that has an impervious surface limitation of 60%, and they will meet that, as does the corner lot. So. Well, it's, the development by, the, by the way, the citation in the, in the comp plan is 1-91, and it talks about density stabilization, and that's the point on the North End that I need to, I, mean, I need to highlight that when I have an opportunity like this because fire, water, use and enjoyment of your land 
it's of, of a high, high sensitivity on the north end. And so reducing density and stabilizing, say, hey, the future is not going to change on you. That's the, the point. We can, we can make that the historic district that it is and preserve it. Um, that's my view. That's not the law. Um, um, but thank you for answering that question clearly. And if I can add, that, that provision in, in the comp plan about stabilization, again, I've, I've lived this for the last, you know, 35, 40 years. It's been a, a, a back and forth and a debate at the North End because if you go back 30 years, 40 years, over, well, the, the vast majority of the properties were single family. And a tremendous amount of redevelopment has taken place. And until the overlay, which the North End Civic League was wise to uh, get on board with, that was done first in Old Beach, since that's been adopted, we haven't had anywhere near the same number of duplexes. We have had a lot of, you know, two small cottage single family on one lot, but that's why it's there is because they, in the comp plan, because the North End Civic League desired to not see all the single family homes turn into duplexes and, and two units on each one. And this is consistent with, with that intent that's in the comprehensive plan. And, and, that's, and it's been done before. This isn't the first time we've done almost identical same thing over the years. And um, I, I certainly think it's in everybody's better interest, but appreciate staff's work on this and the conditions are acceptable. All right, any other questions? Ms. Hippen. Got my name right. Yes. <laughs> um, I see on the on the um, concept here that's pictured that you've got the corner home uh, parking behind, and it came up during the informal session. Uh, where's the parking going to be for the other two homes? Right. The, the, oh, it's in it's in in front. In, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, and that's, to be clear, that's technically it's it is behind. It's actually the the house will face. The feeder road, so it's really the side, but I, I, it is also the rear. And the, the owners of the property adjacent are building a very sig significant single family are signers to one of those letters. They, and they've seen this plan and totally have no objection to this plan. They're in support of the variance. Okay, so so their, their ingress will be from 65th. The, the, two, because, the two because, lots that are the two western lots, absolutely. Yes. Okay. It's only the corner lot that'll come off the feeder road. And it's the feeder road yes. property to the north that abuts it. They're, com they've, they're completely in support of this application, this plan. The folks who have concerns um, live to the west on 65th Street, adjacent to the third lot back that's totally conforming. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? None. Uh, Mr. Don, I appreciate the Edels doing what they're doing. They're getting rid of the, the, the nonconformity. They're making it less, and they're also getting uh, the density less. So I appreciate that. So right now I'm going to open it for discussion. If there aren't any, I'll take a motion. Move to approve. Um, I have a motion on Mr. Plumley. Second. Second by Ms. Hippen. Is there any discussion? None. We'll vote. Vote is open. I'm a yes. Thank you. <laughs> By a vote of 10 to 0, item number 12, CNC Development Company has been recommended for approval. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would like for a second to um, wish everybody happy Thanksgiving and to, since it is the this, this season, um, and Ms. Bilo did such a nice job with the prayer, I want to thank each and every one of you for all the time you sacrificed to our city to, to engage in this process, and it is a time-consuming endeavor. And for that, all of our citizens, and I'm certainly very appreciative, and thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that concludes our formal session. Thank you.